so I, I, I'm starting with a disclaimer. I'm by no means a security <coughs> expert, but I'm here at a web security uh, meetup. But I sort of, uh, I'm trying to be a performance expert, or at least I'm thinking uh, performance is a very important part of our job as front end developers. So, in my pursuit uh, to achieving the maximum performance, uh, I came across some uh, problems in my current assignment and I want to share this uh, story with you so I'm so I am I, I'm working at the forward but I'm currently my current assignment is start mill and I don't did anyone ever heard of start mill did anybody have ever heard of start page yeah okay so start mill is a secure web mail client and they uh, they tell everybody that privacy is a basic, basic human right, and I'm actually, I actually agree with them. Uh, and I, they do privacy by design. So everything they do, it starts with taking privacy into account. Um, and so this is their home page. And no, that's it. Yeah. Your mind is blown by that. Yeah. So your mind will be blown by what their application will look like because this is their current web application. So my assignment is to make this uh, a bit more uh, future proof to make it responsive and uh, to make it a modern web app. So uh, these are the, the USPs of Start Mail. So they do full P PGP encryption. They do mailbox encryption, which is actually quite nice because what that means is that everything is encrypted and closed until the user uh, logs on, so they cannot access anything as start mail, uh, as being start mail. Uh, they don't store your email address and they do minimal logging. So they also do start page, which is which is a uh, search engine. It, it, it's actually Google search results, but they uh, they delete all the logging because they say when we uh, just have normal server logging on, and we have you, and we have your IP address, and we have your uh, 30 days or of search history. We actually know who you are, so they they actually try really hard not to store anything and delete uh, delete all those uh, logins. So they uh, they also don't keep a user profile, and they say that delete is deleted, which means that after two weeks, when you delete a message, it will actually be deleted. Of the internet, which is, I think, uh, unique for uh, web mail clients. This means that they uh, they do everything themselves from start to finish. From they set up their own servers, everything they control for themselves, uh, and that has some <coughs> implications for me, which is that I cannot do I cannot use cloud services. I cannot run things against web pages, which I think is important. I cannot do page speed insights. I use NGOG, which is tunneling over SSH through the United States of America, which they don't like because there is the Patriot Act, which they don't like. Uh, and they don't use content delivery networks since they uh, host everything themselves on their own service, which means I have uh, a lot of latency. And they also don't do native apps, and that's something I really like. Uh, they, so in the first place, they don't like it because uh, it takes a lot of development capacity. capacity. Uh, and the second thing is that actually native apps are sort of this black box where privacy is actually uh, a, a bigger problem than on the web. And maybe you've heard about stories that Facebook is actually listening in on you when your phone is turned off on you. Uh, and it's just rumors. Nobody knows for sure. Uh, but there are stories that you get advertisements from uh, things you just talked about when your phone is off on the table. Uh, this is not possible uh, on the web, N not yet at least. So uh, I guess that's also a thing why they don't like made effect. And actually, I really like that because we like to build uh, progressive web apps. It's a thing we <coughs> try to do for all our clients. Uh, we invest our, some of our own time in, into that because we just really like that. And there's even a safe thing, which, well, most of the time, it's just because it only runs on HTTPS. But I think uh, we will see later that there's more considerations uh, in being safe. And 
they told me, yeah, we, we're not going to do native apps. And I told them, well, that's cool because this is what the web can do today. And that's really cool. And we can build sort of native apps or app like experience on the web. Um, and uh, the problem with this, or at least what's, what, what I discovered, is as new web APIs become available, front enders get also more responsibilities. And we also saw this in Philips talk. And for me, security was never my responsibility, or at least. Not that much. I mean, I always thought do it on the server, and then I can just inner HTML everything, right? So it's sanitized, sanitized already. <laughs> so I want to talk about that latency problem because, like I said before, I like performance, and I want to do something about that latency problem because latency. Everybody knows what latency is. It's actually uh, what time it takes for a packet to send from one location to the other, which is at the speed of light, which means from this is startmail.com, which is uh, somewhere in the Netherlands. Uh, and you can see that, that so every request will, for the United States, will, for example, like Los Angeles or San Francisco, will take 150 milliseconds for every request. And we cannot do anything about that because that's the speed of light. And we can not change anything about that. Uh, their main clientele is in the United States. So that means that most of the users will get 150 milliseconds of latency. You can even see that in Australia, it's 300 milliseconds. And then I want to talk a bit about response times, which is a research from uh, Jacob Nielsen, where he says that 100 milliseconds feels instant to the user. Uh, I think uh, Gmail started with the 100 millisecond rule, which they said, so everything you did in their application should uh, give you feedback, you should give the user feedback within 100 milliseconds. And uh, one second means that a user feels uninterrupted. So I would say that you you should aim for that one second when doing network requests and when, I don't know, clicking a checkbox, it should, uh, it, it, it should uh, change within 100 milliseconds. So to achieve that one second, uh, that, and you, all, you already have to uh, you already have to take into account the latency, and you still have to get everything across the wire. That can be quite difficult. So we want to control that. And since we can't do anything about latency, we will <coughs> try to fake it, because that's perceived performance. Maybe you heard about that. You can do stuff visually, animate stuff. You can actually make the user feel that he's not waiting. Uh, and we can, <coughs> so to take care of that latency, we want something like a network proxy in the browser, and that's something that exists. It's what progressive web apps are mostly based on, which is the service worker. We actually did some projects with service worker. So we, this is our own website. You can install it. It will give you this splash screen. It's not even related to the service worker, but it will work offline, and we will cache pages. And <coughs> it will, uh, we will negate the network as much as possible, uh, and it will sort of uh, have, have offline as bones. And then there's Strata, something I didn't do, but my colleagues, which uh, also caches a lot of things. Uh, you can still visit your favorites when online. And more caching stuff, right? And we did Trau, which is also a progressive web page. You can install it. Uh, I think Peter will talk uh, later on the next meetup about how we Fix the progressive web app on iOS, and I, and these are just the examples we did, and these are all public websites. So now this is a uh, authenticated website, so it's uh, it's a bit different. So I will walk you uh, through how we do it, how how I did this. Uh, but first, I want to give you a short introduction to service. How who's, who who knows about service workers? I, I'm going to walk you through this really fast. Uh, so I'm not going to talk a lot about service worker, but at least the things I use here. So I'm using this as a proxy in the browser, which means that it sits, uh, it's a script which sits, sits between the page and the server, and every request will cross the service worker, and you can do stuff with it. Right? So this is the service worker in the middle. And then what we can do is on fetch, we can actually not go to the network, but go back to the page again. So what we can do is we can get something and we fetch it, so we get it from the server, get back to the service worker, put it in cache storage, and serve it to that page. 
And then on the next request, we can go to service worker, check the cache, see that we have it, and return it, which means we don't go to the server at all. So this will uh, it will not have a network latency if we even work offline. And then you have this technique of which I really like for <coughs> this late to, to, to achieve this latency problem, which where we do still while we validate. So we go from the page to the service worker. We, uh, if we have something in cache, we return it to the page as soon as possible. In the meantime, we will go to the network, do the request, then get it back into cache, and we will check whether the response is different than the thing we served before. And if so, we can do something. And what we do, for example, on Full site is well, it's a static website. So what we do is we will give you this banner where we say this page is out of, out of date and you can update it. So you can click it and the page will refresh, but it was already fetched, so it will be instant. But for a start mail, this is actually uh, uh, I can do even better stuff because it's a single page app, so I can actually just update the state. So we'll just pop in a new message uh, once I see that you have new messages. Which is, I, I guess, a, it's a common pattern you see in email boxes, right? You just see messages popping in once you receive them. It doesn't really matter that you get the message uh, like two seconds later. So I was like, let's do this. Let's uh, build this thing. So this is the new start. So again, I'm. This is heavy development. So uh, there will be uh, some stuff that you think like this can be better, but. Uh, this is the new start mail on high speed internet. This is just a really fast internet. So we'll load in folders, which is a request. We load in the uh, overview, which is a request. Load in the message, and then we go back, and we do the request again. We check the same message, we do a request again. We go back, we do the request again. So you can improve uh, on this. I mean, we could keep things in state and whatever. I mean, we have to, but we, uh, let's see how we can do this with a service worker. So this is with a service worker with that still while we validate technique. You will not see any updates while we validate because it didn't change, but here we go. So again, we need to load in the data, load in the message, but then when we go back, it will be instant because it will be served from cache and the message will be served from cache. And going to spam, it will request the data again and here again. But when we go back, it will be instant again because we cache that things. But you can see that there's a, a, a big benefit in. So this is next to each other. This is a very scientific experiment where my clicking is on the exact same speed. Uh, <laughs> and what you can see, it's, it is the same path. Uh, I also, yeah. Uh, what, what you can see is that it's 24 seconds versus 16 <laughs> seconds. I'm still clicking and waiting for stuff to happen. So this again is on high speed internet. Uh, this will become a lot worse when you go on on 3G, for example. And this will, so uh, like the, the, the cache response will even work offline. So it doesn't really matter. The offline is a bonus, right? It's not about, it's about, it's about negating the network as much as possible um, and still keeping the to-date content. So if we look into our console, we can see that we have this cache storage here. You showed us the local storage uh, Four, so you can see that we have uh, we have four requests cached uh, cached here. So there's the URL and there's a response object there. So we can uh, what we can do now is that it even works offline, right? So I need to click here and then I will delete the authentication cookie. What do you think will happen? I'll delete it, so I'm unauthorized to view any of my messages. I'll refresh the page and there are my messages, and then. There's my email. So if I go, then you can actually see that the request for the folder is filled somewhere. If I open the console, I see all kinds of uh, unauthorized requests. If I open a message which is not cached, you can see that it will keep loading. So yeah, okay, yeah, well, we didn't catch this error yet. So, uh, but you can see that it will keep loading. It will just miserably fill. But, a little bit above, you can see that the revalidation request was also failing. But you can still see the messages when you are uh, when you are uh, unauthenticated. So this is actually what you would do in a service worker what, what to see whether you have a cache response. So you would uh, get the URL. So here I just hard-coded it. 
I'll just paste it in there. So I'll say cashes.net, check whether I have a response. Uh, and I will just log it. And you can see that I have a, a response body logged here. So if I open it, then there it is. There's my email message in the browser, uh, cached client side. So this is on my home computer, right? So oh, I'm caching sensitive data. I mean, I would say that email sensitive data, I would even say that or start mill where they say that privacy is their main selling point that this is quite harmful. Even if it is on my own computer, I don't want to be the one uh, uh, leaking sensitive data when somebody in the internet cafe will uh, go to start mill and see, see it and, and, and will leak this, uh, this email. So again, that's no problem, right? Somebody did this before. There's a lot of progressive web apps. We build a lot of those uh, uh, already. But then I just searched everywhere, and all uh, examples and everything we built was all it was all just public website with with content publicly available with not guessing sensitive data. So I plugged in my uh, phone to my computer, and I went to Twitter Live, which was a big deal, right? When it went live, is what use progressive web app. Even Twitter is using it now. And then I was checking what they do with the service work, and it's just push notification and caching the app shell. They don't do uh, what, so, and that that would not even be sensitive data, but they don't do caching on uh, authenticated requests. So I guess I was sort of uh, on my own. So I thought, so how could I solve this? So once you log out, you, I will just delete everything cached towards, or uh, when you refresh the browser, I will in before and load. I don't know. I'll just delete it. But it was just a, it, it is quite a hassle to write all the service worker code, and it would be a waste of effort if I would just delete that on every page refresh or, uh, oh, and probably email messages will never change. I learned that they can change, actually. Um, so the next thing is I thought, well, maybe I can do that on the authentication thing on cache storage, but I actually don't know how, so if somebody knows how to do I don't think that's possible. So the last thing I never thought I would do was maybe I should do something with encryption. I have no clue how to do that, but let's try, man. I mean, we can do that. So uh, I will show a lot of code now. I hope you like that. So this is what I would write in the service worker. So on fetch, so this is where the request would come in. Um, I just filled out all the API get requests, so I'm, just, I'm not going to share the code with you. And then we'll say something like, like uh, respond with uh, another response with it, which is try cache and then network. We will walk through that uh, later. So we'll pass the request and the uh, cache name. And otherwise, we'll just go to the network and do nothing with those uh, requests. So if we look at the try cache and then network function, we, again, like I, like I showed you in the console before, we'll open the cache for the cache name. We will check if we have a cached response for that URL. If we have one, we will decrypt the response, but we haven't got any yet, so we'll walk through the decrypting, uh, decryption part later. So what we'll do, we'll fetch the response and we'll cache it in cache storage. Cache storage. So if we look at that fetch and cache uh, function, then uh, we get the response, so we just do the request. Uh, we'll pass the cookie by passing the credentials include, and then we'll, uh, we need to encrypt that thing. So we'll say encrypt the response in a function, and then we will uh, open the cache. We will uh, cache the encrypted response, and we'll just return the non-encrypted response to the browser so I don't have to decrypt it, right? Uh, to change the response, we can create a text out of the out of the response body, and then this encrypt thing will need to encrypt a string with a super secret password. So I'll, I'll, I'll we'll come back to the super secret password. So for now, this is just hard coded there. This is my private key, and then we'll get a uh, encrypted body, and from that encrypted body, we will create a new response and we'll return that to the uh, well to the, the the promise chain we saw earlier. So. I used Forge. Did anybody ever heard of that? It's, it, it seemed uh, appropriate for me in the first place because it looked quite easy. And I could copy paste uh, most of this. 
<laughs> this, this, so this was just the, 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 the proof of technology, right? Can I do this? So I just use this library. Um, and what it actually, it gives you a lot of uh, helper functions to create random stuff. So I need to create a salt uh, and, I, and, and, I need, and I need to create a key, which is actually a combination of the salt and the private key, like the super secret password I had before. And a salt is a random data that is used as an additional input uh, to a one-way function that hashes a password to password. So it just complicates with a random string the passwords for every app. So it will never be the same if you would do that twice or multiple times. And then I need a initialization factor, which is used. I even have a definition for that, this. It's an unpredictable random number used to initialize an encryption function, and that will result in different cipher text every time you encrypt the same message. So you can actually see that we will use that initialization factor, also sometimes called a nonce, I think, right? It's not the same. No, not the same. Um, uh, something different, like uh, Philip yeah, said. A nonce is used to ensure presence, so if you have the same message being sent, if you have a nonce, you can tell you every time. Yeah, so the message will be not even the same. Ah, okay. But it, it's similar, but it's usually it's yeah. Okay. So uh, and then we have this cipher, which will we will use the key there. This is the algorithm. I have no clue with if, whether I would use a different algorithm. This seems uh, appropriate. I googled it a bit, and I think this is okay, right? That's beyond the scope. Of I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's beyond the scope of this. Uh, this talk. Some, I can correct me if I don't see the symbol. I have no idea what they are though. What it is. Okay. Ask crypto actually. No. I I asked the guys at uh, Start Mill who are actually uh, quite. Uh, they know a lot about security, and they said it was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, great. Great. Yeah. so uh, we'll have this cipher. You can start it where we use the initialization factor, right? To start that cipher thing, so it will be different every time. And then you'll update it and you finish it. I don't know. This is just uh, this is just how that works. So it returns a string, uh, and I can actually return an object from here with with the cipher text, which is the encrypted message, the salt, which I need later on for decrypting. And the initialization factor again, to, which I need later for uh, decrypting. So we can encrypt the string. Uh, so to recap, this is uh, what I had before, which is what which was the response object. Then I will create a string out of this because I can uh, uh, I can encrypt this, and then the result is that I have well, this is a lot longer than. See here, but the result is that I have a cipher text which is the actual message, but you cannot read anything from it. So I, I guess this looks uh, quite okay. Right? I, I don't know. Can you uh, keep crickets? Decryption. So right, we did the fetch and cache thing and encrypting. So now the thing which we have to do is we have to decrypt that response. So we have something in cache storage, which is the, the, encrypt, uh, the encrypted response you saw earlier. So now we have to decrypt this. So this, uh, uh, you see, yeah, okay. So but again, we have the response. We get the response body, which is that object, right, with the cipher text, uh, the initialization factor, and the salt. Uh, we need to decrypt that with, this, with the secret key again, or the private key again, and then again we'll create a new response object with the uh, with the, the, the actual initial uh, message. So if we look at the decryption function, then we get the cipher text, the salt, and the initialization factor, and we get the password. And then this is just uh, sort of the, the other way around. So the key we have to uh, decode six for the salt and then the password, so we get the same key. I don't know how that actually works, it, it doesn't feel I When I wrote this, I was like, this is not secure, right? Because how can you, it's a random thing, but then here I can just decode code it and then I get the password again. What do you mean? 
like this thing, <laughs> <laughs> and then then use the decode sixty four. This is just a utility thing. So, yeah, so it, I, I'm saving the salt with the uh, ciphertext, not the password, of course. Okay, but but then uh, this thing is. I I just didn't get why I should save the salt with the salt yeah. secret. No, I understand, but but how is how how are uh, in the first place I'm complicating things with the salt, but then here I can just easily sort of turn it the other way around. Yeah, so essentially, what you're doing with salt is every time you encrypt something, you create a new salt. Yeah. So even if your password is the same, yeah, the key will be Different derived effort. from the password and the salt. Yeah. So it's a different starting point. So okay, so the, yeah. so so the thing is, is you 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 probably need like multiple salts to get the password, but because the no. salt is every time something different, that's yes. sort of impossible. Even if you have a hundred thousand messages, they're all encrypted with different keys, so there's no way to start looking for commonalities in the messages. Because the more you encrypt with the key, the more vulnerable it becomes. So uh, things like SSL, TLS, they they do key rotations. So after a while, the browser yeah. the server okay. says yeah. that. Now, yeah. use this key enough, let's yeah. generate a new yeah. and start using this. Yeah. And what you do with the salt here is you generate a new key and uh, every time you get the PBKDF2 uh -huh. function. Yeah. Actually, it stands for password based key derivation function. And what it means is it takes a password as input and does some hashing to make a cryptographic key out of it because the password is way too long, uh, way too short, and not secure to use as a key. Mm -hmm. While the thing that comes out of the function is long enough to be used as a key for. I'm very glad that you are here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very glad that we found a, a very good example of why the point is. Yeah. So, so far, uh, I'm quite impressed. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <No>, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, so, please, 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 please screw this up. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, 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 so I, I felt the pressure. <laughs> so, I'll <laughs> decipher the. I don't know. Probably the TV tuning out. It's not found. Uh, what, UFM, why, uh, why is this happening? <laughs> Could you also re airplay? What? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Should I do that again? Can we? <coughs> Is that here? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, we'll decipher that. Thing and we'll get a string out of that, and well, then when we get it in here, so we decide the thing, and then uh, we'll just uh, uh, create a new response with the uh, decrypted message again. So if we would put that together, so I made a screencast again, so to profit, I need to click again. So we go to uh, we go to the the inbox, we'll see that the service worker is registered. We actually see that we have this overview messages thing inside of the messages cache as a response. So we'll check this. This will be instant, right? And we'll open a new message. It will take a while again. We go back. So we'll cache some things. We'll see that there you go. We have some, we have more interest cache. And then when I Copy paste the URL. I'll paste it in here and do the same thing like I did before. So I got the message. Now you will actually see that we get the encrypted message instead of the actual message. So that looks uh, that looks quite promising. There's just one more thing. Maybe you can guess what that is, which is the password. super secret password, because that's not super secret, right? So this is, uh, I didn't try this out because that's uh, the, the, I need the API, API guys uh, for this. I could try it myself, but this is just uh, a fault. So I did wrote it down in code on my side, but uh, uh, 
I was thinking about make th that when you do an authenticated request, you will get the crypto key as a response header. And that means that instead of hard coding that here where it was super secret password, I can actually get that from the response because I, right, I'm authenticated here because I would pass the authentication cookie and then I would get a header with the crypto key and I can use that so I don't need to hard code it here. You can bash me later. All right. <laughs> then uh, for, de for decrypting, that's, uh, I guess, uh, a little bit more complicated, but I guess that this is from the page, not from the service worker. So when I would log in, so I would use an MM password and API off, uh, I would get the, uh, in the response, I would get the crypto key. I would save that in my, uh, in my uh, single page app, just in memory in JavaScript. Uh, and I would do the same. So if you would refresh the browser, I would do a get request for the authentication, <coughs> to the authentication API again. And I would again get the crypto key as a uh, response header. And then when I would do a request to the, uh, to the API again, I can pass in that crypto key as a request header. I could even do this only when service worker is supported. So this would only be there for service worker supported browsers. And then when decrypting the response, I could get that, right? This is, this is the, the request from the page. So I could get that again from the request header. And then else, I could even strip that out again so it doesn't hit the network. Although it does hit the network when doing uh, uh, or when I when I want to encrypt stuff, right? But sure, that it doesn't come from the server. I don't know if that's a problem. So I guess the sort of the balance is that I this this doesn't work offline anymore because I would always need to be authenticated uh, before I for having the encryption key or the crypto key but i do still have control over the network and i guess the the, the sort of a misconception about service work is, uh, is that it is about offline but it's not it's about controlling that network uh, and offline is the bonus so i'm giving up the bonus but i think i'm sort of uh, doing a private <coughs> thing so i said uh, uh, there's this last thing which i so I looked on MDN and then I ran to the web cryptography, web cryptography API. And then on MDN it said that browser support was really bad. And then I was making the presentation and I needed a screenshot for that the support is really bad. And I went to Can I Use and I was like, oh, this is not that bad actually. <laughs> so uh, I guess my next step would be to not use Forge as a library, but use uh, the native JavaScript implementation for it. For encrypting and decrypting, because you have the same algorithm, it's just uh, more complicated than the library. Does the library use it? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. I think it does uh, do the crypto dot get random, like the random, the random thing generated. There's this one thing in the cryptography API. I think they use that, but I, I don't know the, the library also works in Node. It's not browser yeah. specific. Yeah. So, it can't be so uh, that that sort of was my story. I think that was my story about uh, uh, service workers and uh, my enthusiasm for service workers. But uh, I also ran ran across this uh, this problem that uh, I actually like to also make this happen in uh, authenticated apps, but it's actually quite hard. I uh, guess that's what I. Uh, so, thanks for listening. Thank you for listening. And I have to say that StarkNet is hiring. It is a really cool company. They build really, really cool stuff. They give me time to build progressive web apps, to uh, probably make an Electron app out of this and embrace the web. So, that's really cool. Uh, but I also uh, did full results. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. What do you, what do you think about this uh, approach? It's sort of this. Uh, Proof of technology. So I want to do this uh, again, but then with the Web Crypto API. But please uh, shoot. Can we clap? Yeah. First. Okay.
key response uh, that we catch from the service worker. Yes. Um, there's the, uh, the header with the script of this, right? Uh, no, I can strip that out before uh, putting it into cache uh, storage. And you, you strip out the header before. Yeah. Ah, that's, yeah. That's we'll, my question. Yeah. Because if you have to yeah. store the whole request. Yeah. yeah. So it does come over the network as a response header, but before caching it, I can just strip the header out, create a new response, put that in cache without that. I, I think we might be putting it in cache anyway, because what you see in the console is that uh, it's a request response pair. Mm -hmm. And as a request, it shows just the URL, mm -hmm. but really that's a full unique request object, including all the headers. Mm -hmm. So I think you can even put it in. I think it might be in the cache storage, just not in your response, but in your request. Because uh, you're sending it along in your request. You go back. You have a screen with the, the cache. Console open. No, no. Yeah, you yeah, have that. Oh, like. Uh, you mean yeah. somewhere here in the in the video? Can yeah, you see okay, it? Maybe yeah. Sorry. Or, uh, what's the question? <laughs> 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 well, I thought I figured a way around it because you're um, you're encrypting the response. You're making sure that only the response body is cached mm -hmm. and not the headers. Yeah, okay. So you mean I'm not encrypting the response headers? No, but we're, you're saving different, you're making your own fake response headers, right? That yeah, you're true. saving. Yeah. But the request actually also contains headers in the cache, which you don't see. Oh, is that so? I didn't yeah, know that. Ah, okay. So they show a URL, yeah, but yeah. it's a unique object. So, ah, so I also I, need I to. Uh, we might be storing it in the request header now. Okay. <laughs> so, anybody else? Yeah. Um, suppose you had somebody who knew that they're like, crap, I'm going to go to what the fuck you stand on that no network. You don't want to do anything else. Would, they, would it be possible to build in? So, a lot of computers will have a wallet. Mm -hmm. Which is always very annoying. It always pops up and asks you for crap and you don't want to. But yeah. um, I've more than once triggered in my browser that the only one that is just pass phrase from my browser. Yeah. Um, so that's something a browser can hook into is the operating system wallet. Mm -hmm. um, you could have it maybe that if somebody says, you know what, I know I'm going to this crap network mm -hmm. and I can't afford that required authentication. Mm -hmm. um, that it's that they could substitute, for example, some, some master password or a or yep. thing or something in there yep. instead of super secret password or a combination of the two. Yeah, so where, where you mix the two together, because that would be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, th I think that's true. I mean, I, you can do whatever you want. So you, that, I think if the request or the decryption would fail, you have to, yeah, you, you can communicate <laughs> between the page and, uh, and the service worker. So you could do communication between the page, uh, render a uh, when the input field where you can you can pass in your super secret password and then get it back and then it would still work offline. So I guess it would it would be possible to make something work offline. I just think that that's the bonus. I think uh, I think it's a uh, uh, I think it's a. Uh, or did it have to explicitly turn it on? So sure. Yeah. Ninety nine percent of the time, and yeah. then yeah. all it becomes. Yeah. 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 Oh gosh. <laughs> I, I, and I think that uh, the the web crypto API. As uh, as some sort of mechanism to store private keys safely on the uh, on the user's device, so that also could help, maybe, right? So that you actually save it on the uh, on your device. But then I would, yeah. So how would that work in the internet cafe, right? Because you don't yeah, you save just, it privately on the. Can, can you just say no? Yeah. It's a prompt. No. No. Okay. Anybody else? Do you want to say <laughs> something? <laughs> I'm processing. Okay. So what? Um, um, the thing I have most trouble with is finding the, the right scenarios which you want to protect. So you did mention things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing you talked about here is before, right? 
uh, yeah, well, and, and then running into this problem that if you have uh, privacy, which is, okay, I guess you need to be secure to be private, right? But uh, privacy is their main, their main concern. That's what, that's their unique selling points. I cannot just, I mean, it's just, it, it, this is the same with local storage. If you ever save something to local storage, I mean, it's saved on the domain, like you said, you cannot get there from another domain, but it's still somewhere there on the computer. If you share a computer in the library and they don't clean, uh, clean up sessions uh, very well, I mean, that could be a problem. The, the, I mean, the service worker would be registered for, I actually don't know how that would work, right? If you would be on the same computer, you would log in with your start mail email address and I would log in, that would be the same URL. So, okay, we cannot, uh, decrypt our, our messages, but it would be the same uh, uh, scope and it would be the same cache storage or you need to create cache storages for users. I mean, I, mean, this, the, I, I do think that there's a well, lot of more. Well, one, I would hope that someone would describe the city and then start with us. Everything disappears. It's disappeared, yeah. So that's, so that's, that's one sure. thing. Another thing you could do with the session storage. That's a known brother of local storage. You could probably wait for a specific window. Yeah, but it, but you don't have the, the, the that doesn't have the, the, the like the proxy uh, uh, behavior. No, you can store the, the key there. Ah, there okay. Once the window is closed, the yeah. storage is yeah. as well. Yeah. So so that's basically where where or in the session we would store it, and the header was just the way to get it from session yeah. storage to the service worker. Yeah. But I think the, the issue is that we want to introduce a client side cache for performance, and we have no way to invalidate the cache in the, the right moment so that no one else can get there. Yeah. So we just basically try and find a hack to make the cache inaccessible once yeah, you need it, right? So it's store. Yeah. But we also want to make sure that you can basically, that it doesn't fail if the network fails. Because if we do only session storage and not cache storage, we no, I yeah. agree about the cache storage. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, the header thing with your mm -hmm. you store the session store. Ah. So the live frame from server origin, you need to start the domain, but only store the key there. So that you never mm -hmm. even... Yeah, so what I also thought is maybe you could, uh, I mean, uh, you want to make it sort of easy for the user, right? But what you can also do is just uh, have a setting somewhere where you could say, uh, so this is a secure computer, uh, put your private key in here and we'll save it wherever you want because well you, you said that this is a this is I, I would store my private key on my phone i mean there's a lot of private stuff on my phone right so on my own phone i could just type it in and then it would, wouldn't even be on the server with start mail so it would be just a client side thing so um, so then you would just say if service worker is supported and uh, you, you chose to uh, do client side caching so can you even get to session storage from a uh, service worker? Uh, you can well, get to local uh, not, no, not, not directly, but you can just do to the page. I mean, message. Sure. <laughs> so let's uh, uh, finish with some drinks. And uh, we have a no, 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 no. Oh, and the uh, result. <laughs> I just want to tell you that we also have a progressive web app. Uh, workshop later on in January, I think it is. So if you want to learn more, not about the encryption stuff, but about just doing this on public websites where it is still complicated, but uh, a little bit uh, easier, then uh, I think you should join. It, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> yes. Okay.